coming up next on Button to Christ Ministries. The lady said, even the crumbs I'm happy with. Even if you don't answer my prayer exactly the way I want it, Lord. It's the attitude of prayer. It's the attitude and the approach we take to God. When we come to God and say, God, take me as I am. Whatever you choose is. Most people come and say, Lord, I want you to do this. I need this job by tomorrow. I need that type of car, God. And if it don't happen, we stop, go church. That's it. We cut God off. We don't get it. God is giving us a message tonight as we close. God is giving us a message that the woman, a no-name brand, a woman, a Canaanite woman from nowhere, woman wasn't even recognized. God is saying, if you are not recognized, just come to me in prayer. I love you. I care for you. I know what you're going through. I love you. Just come to me in prayer and I will hear. Stay tuned. Praise the Lord. I just want to welcome everyone tonight. And we know we have a lot of visiting friends watching live, and some people have called into the prayer line. But we just want to welcome you and one of my favorite friends. I can't say favorite friend, one of them. She's not smiling. Praise God. <laughs> God is awesome and powerful. We just want to welcome you as we fellowship tonight. We know you're going to be blessed. And uh, we just want to welcome also those who are watching, thanking you for sending in your requests and for praying for us. You know, we have some amazing Facebook friends who always watching, always on, right on time. We want to say thanks to you, especially Brother Andrew from Portugal. Praise the Lord. And Brother Royce. We can't leave out Brother Royce from Australia. And lots of friends from the U.S. always watching. Praise God. And Jamaica and U.K. Uh, we have a lot of friends in U.K. As a matter of fact, I receive a, a, a WhatsApp message from U.K. today. And it was urgent. I know I, got, I get a lot of urgent messages from all over. But this one was telling that somebody in the hospital in a coma as we speak, and his name is Mohammed, and he said, we need prayers. So it prompted me, the Lord prompted me to call that, that individual right away and pray with them. And it was just an amazing time praying with this woman of God. And I know you will hear much about her. I know you know we sent out the blast to pray for Mohammed. He's in a coma. And I'm thanking the Lord that something big is going to happen. Muhammad is going to stand up and he's going to be restored. So I'm just saying thanks to the Lord. God is truly awesome and powerful. God has given me a, a word as usual tonight. We prayed and asked the Lord for a word and say, what should we tell your people tonight? And the Lord brought me back to about a week ago. I was in my bed. I went to bed late. And a scripture kept coming to me. And I was wrestling with God and said, but the Lord, I did that scripture. I preached that sermon twice. And the Lord heard my cry. The Tuesday, the Lord sent me a word, and that word was last week. And I was wrestling all day today, and the Lord did not give me a word. He said, go back to that same word I showed you. And I'm like, okay, Lord. I did a sermon called, When God Goes Silent. Very powerful. It moved my heart because it was my word. When God goes silent, you can go and look it up and the audio is not the best, but a lot of people, life was changed from listening to that sermon. The Lord sent me back to the same scripture. And to tell you, when the Lord gives you a word, I don't even remember what I preach. 
in some of these sermons. I have to go watch it myself because the Lord led me to these scriptures. And I went back to the scripture today and I said, okay, God, just show me what you want me to say from this. I've done two sermons and this very scripture and you sent me back. So there's something significant about this scripture. And I jot down a few points. And if you want to get the full gist back then what God gave me, go watch the sermon, When God Goes Silent. So I'm going to go to that scripture and talk about Jesus Christ and his ministry. When he was on earth and speaking and going around healing the sick, and he was active in the ministry, preaching the gospel message, and a lot of people come from different places to hear Christ speak. And in Acts chapter, no, Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, I'm always quoting that scripture when the Lord says he's call, he called his disciples and he has given us power to heal the sick, power to cast out demons, authority he has given us. And he says when he called his disciples, he has given us power. And God is saying, where are his disciples? Are we truly claiming the power? So when you look back on his, on, his, uh, on his ministry, he went around and he preached the gospel and hundreds of thousands of people came to hear him speak. And as usual, he will get tired and he will go up into the mountain and he will reside there. But he kept communicating with his father, God, the Almighty. He kept praying. And if Christ have the need to pray. What about us? What are we learning? Why do we pray so little? When we have Wednesday night prayer meeting, only about three or four in Brother Sean, three or four there are just a little handful of people there to listen, to pray. When prayer is the communication link between us and God, prayer move the hand of God, Prayer is a key, as I said the other day. It opens doors and allows blessings to come down. So why do we pray so little? It's because we don't believe. We have doubt and unbelief. We prefer to do everything else. When there is a concert in the church, you can't get seat anywhere. But when there is prayer meeting, the pews are all empty. Not enough people. The weather is beautiful. We know we have a lot of people online watching. We know we have a lot of people from the U.S. Call into the prayer line and we connect everything. But these pews here should have been filled to capacity because of prayer, because it's the way we connect with God. But everybody have everything else to do out there. But when it comes to prayer, probably we don't really fully believe that when you pray, God answers, and we can get answers to prayer. But some people who pray and experience the power always come. I'm telling you, when you look on Paul's life, when Paul met Christ on the road to Damascus, his life changed. He wasn't the same any longer. Anywhere there was prayer meeting, Paul was there. Peter, who denied Christ, Anywhere there's prayer meeting, he was there also. Anywhere there's intercessory prayers, Daniel loved to pray. Because they seen the connection. There's just something about praying and seeing the hands of God move. But nowadays we have a lot of Christians who are not really serious. The church is filled with people. But they are not coming fervent prayers. There's not go, prayers going up like sweet smelling savor because people are there because of self. People are there because of issues that they're going through. Never there to commune with God and to pray and to lift holy hands. So God is asking us tonight, why do we go to church? I want you to go with me to Matthew chapter 15. And we're going to be reading 
from verses 21 onward. Matthew chapter 15. I want you to just go to verse 1 for me. Verse 1. Uh, uh, verse 1 and 2 first. Matthew chapter 15. Just to give you a little idea. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees which were of Jerusalem saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. We're talking about tradition and people looking back to things we used to do, burning incense, things we used to do, and not looking to Christ who is the Savior. They were adamant about the tradition and the cultures and how we do things here. This is how we do things here. They were arguing with the Savior and didn't even know it. So what happened then? While they were arguing with our Savior, Jesus Christ, hear what happened then. While they were arguing, it says in verse 21, let's go now to verse 21, Matthew 15, verse 21. Matthew 15, verse 21. Let us pray again. Let us just bow our heads. Father in heaven, O oh God, as we come to the mercy seat, we're asking you, O oh, thou son of David, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, condescend upon your people that is watching, your people in the sanctuary, your people who have called in into this prayer line. Cover us now, O oh God. Hide us, O oh God, beneath the cross. Hide me, O oh God. Fill me with your power so that as your words come forth, it will break the hearts of your people and hearts will be surrendered over to you. Hide me, O oh God. Let not me be seen, Lord, but only Christ high and lifted up. Thank you, O oh God, for taking control of the word. Reconsecrate your sanctuary, your altar, and let the power of Jesus Christ fall afresh on your people. In Jesus Christ's name, I pray. Praise God. Make sure you're taking notes of the, of the scriptures. So let's go to verse 21 now. And it says, then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of the Tyre and Sidon. That's verse 21. So Jesus decided, I'm going to change course. And God is saying, sometimes when we pray, we need to change the way we pray. Christ was in a situation amongst his people, but he wasn't really accepted. He was wrestling. He was trying to spread his gospel message. And people was reasoning amongst God's people was the Pharisees and many people coming up with different argument. And the Lord decided, I'm going to change course. I'm going to just withdraw myself and go into prayer. And as he changed course here, it says in verse 21. Verse 22 says, and behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same course and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. Again, we got to break it down. A mother came out of nowhere. And cried out. And I want you to relate it to prayer. The Lord is saying that when we're going to pray and we need a result, we got to change the way we used to pray. If you used to come in the sanctuary and just sit at the back and pray, the Lord is saying if you want results sometime, you got to come to the front. Change the way you do things. This woman came out of nowhere. A Canaanite woman. 
And if you know the scripture, the Canaanite woman is not a familiar woman then to say. It's not a, a Jewish woman. It's not a Seventh-day Adventist woman. It's a woman who was there, who seen Christ before, who knows, who heard the news about David's son preaching and healing people around. And he know whom David's son is. And she came right there and she cried out and said, Oh, thou son of David, have mercy on me. This is an unknown woman that I research and there's no mention. I try to find who this woman is. She's not the regular person. Is not the regular prayer warrior. She was in need. And she came and she cried out. She didn't remember about anything else. Her needs was great. Her daughter, she cried out and said, my daughter is home. She's demon possessed and I need your help. She knows where to find help. When you are in prayer, you have to know whom is the Lord. You got to know whom to pray to. This woman wasn't a Seventh-day Adventist. She was an unknown, a Canaanite. You don't find Canaanite people mixing with the Israelite. It wasn't that time of the, 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 the season when these people don't mix. They don't have things in common. They were looked on as the outcasts. But here, just as I remember, Jesus is always passing through Jericho. The place where God knows that his people need to be rescued. I know that he know what he was doing. He went into that coast because he know there was a mother. He knows that there's a mother in Zion who's crying out and say, have mercy on me. She came out from nowhere. This woman wasn't worried about her gender. A woman talking to a man. Back then, a woman had to be silent. In certain culture you're going now, women not allowed to speak. The man have to speak first and give her permission. That's how of, some of the cultures are. That woman did not care because she knew who Christ is. He knew, knew who the Savior is. When you need help, all you know is have mercy. Help me. Help me. She said specifically, my daughter is possessed. I want you to look back in it again. It says, verse 22, And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me. What does it mean to say, have mercy on me? When we pray, the Lord is saying, we don't have to go with these long prayers and tell the Lord where you were born, where your parents come from, everything. And you go through every scripture as you know in the Bible. You go through Psalms 91, Psalms 23rd. Everything before you get to the point. You don't need help. Some long prayers telling God everything. And you're saying, are you done yet? Listen, the woman needed help. And when she came to Christ, she said, have mercy. It was an SOS prayer. God is teaching us that when we come to the mercy seat, come with specific prayers. Come and pray and tell God exactly what you need him to do. There's no time to go around the bush and say this and that. A lot of people praying in the church and nothing is happening. We are not getting the gist of what it takes, the ingredients to pray, what we need to do. When you really need help, when you're in a situation and you need out. The woman announced her situation. He said to the Lord, my daughter is at home. 
She's vexed. She's possessed. I need your help. I need you, oh God. Have mercy. Have mercy upon me. A short prayer. Oh Lord, God of David, help me. She personalized it to saying, I know who you are. You are the son of David. God is saying, when we approach the mercy seat, we need to call and tell the Lord, you are God Almighty. We need to address him and say, El Shaddai, great God whom we worship. I need your help. We need to address him. He is the God. He is the beginning and the end. He knows everything. He knows what you're going through. We need not to beat around the bush. God is saying, this woman came straight and said, Lord, I need your help. She said, cut the chase. I need your help. I don't need to pray and pray and go around. I need your help right now. My daughter is at home dying. She wasn't worried if she was going to get an answer. She wasn't worried, is my prayer too short? Is God really there? She wasn't worried. She was there saying, I need your help. I need a breakthrough now. I need a breakthrough. I'm going through stress. I'm going through negativity. I need your help. I need your deliverance. It's going to get even more powerful. In verse 23, it says, But he answered her not a word. So God is saying that when you go to the power source, that woman came directly to the Savior. He knows who he is. He's saying when you go to prayer and you go directly and you're sure who your Savior is, who you're praying to, then it doesn't matter the answers. Can you know that there's no other way? If you are not sure, then when you pray and nothing is happening, you're going to say, well, God don't love me. Why am I a Christian? Why am I paying my tithes? You're going to start to question God. But when you know the Savior, and if you see that he came, she came in the same place where Christ was, meaning that she know Christ, she said, oh, thou son of David, have mercy. She know whom she was talking to. The confidence do you have that confidence when you pray? Do you really know who you pray to? Are you wavering and you're not sure? How can we get answers? A lot of people will tell you that God has various answers. He can say, wait. He can say, no, yes. Many different answers. This woman came and she know that Christ has the power to deliver. And if there's anything wrong, it's me. Who is this woman? Who is this unknown woman? Where was she? Was she going to a Seventh-day Adventist church? Does she have the, 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 the 28 fundamentals? Does she have all of these things? Who is she? Why was she so persistent? Why was she praying without ceasing? Why did she come to Jesus? And she's not even one of the Israelites. He's, she's an outcast. If God is there for even the outcast, what about us? Can God hear our prayers? When he is willing, he is there. The woman came and she cried out. But I'm going to tell you something. Christ did not answer. He said, he said not a word. I remember when I did that first sermon on it. Very powerful. When Christ goes silent, God's silent. When you know you have nowhere else to turn to. Your back is on the ground. You're only looking up. You're not going to go to no psychic. You're not going to go to any occult. Only Jesus Christ you're going to go to. And when you're praying and praying and no answers, nothing. 
you start to question yourself, am I really a Christian? Is it the right church? What was going through this woman's head when Christ did not say a word? Come on. What do you think was going through her head when there was nothing? Do you continue to pray? Do you exercise patience when there's no answer? Do you really wait for an answer? Do you continue to pray without ceasing or you quit? What do you think was in the woman's mind while she was there pressing? Do you think she was wavering and wondering, is this the Savior? Is this God? No. She know that he is Christ. She knows. She had a need and she know that there's no way out. Do you really have a need and an urgency and said, I need answers tonight? And you decide, I'm not leaving the foot of the cross. I'm not getting up off my knees. I'm staying in prayer. Hello, somebody. You got to follow me here. He said, he say not a word. You could look at that as a discouragement. Is there discouragement while you pray? Even the words that you utter. Some people say, why you pray like that? God won't answer you. People listen to your prayer and start to put you down and say, you're not praying good enough. I don't think God will help you. Remember the two men that went up into the sanctuary to pray. And, and, and that man prayed and says, I'm thank God I'm not like that man over there. I pay my tithes. I do this. I do this. And the other man just smote his chest and said, have mercy upon me, O God. Just they have mercy. SOS prior. Could you imagine what was going through the woman's mind right there? While the Lord says nothing. Was she discouraged? Do you discourage when you stay on your knees for three, four hours praying about a situation and nothing? Is God really there still? Is the God we serve still available when he says nothing? That's discouragement. If you want to look at it this way, that when, he, when she approached Jesus, she saw him. She had the discerning power that she know that Christ is there and he did not answer. It's even more discouraging more than some of us. Because when some of us pray, we don't sure if he's there. <laughs> Mercy, I don't think you get it. When some of us pray, in, we need, you see, a powerful faith. And when we pray, we don't sure if God is there. But this woman, sure, she saw Christ. She asked a question and said, could you have mercy upon me? And he ignored her. No words. Can we have faith like this to be there? Lord, it's deep, Lord. Holy Spirit, help me. Listen, when we pray, we don't see God and we are doubtful. But this woman saw him and prayed and he ignored her. That's greater discouragement. That discouragement is to say, you're not worthy. What are you doing in here? Who are you? You're not even a Jew. You know, where are you from? You don't belong here. What are you doing here? When you approach the mercy seat with prayer, and it seems like nothing is working, God wants to show us that we need to press regardless. Listen to this. Look at the, at the next part of the verse, what it says. We're in verse 23 still. After the Lord answered not a word, not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, send her away, for she crieth, after us. Oh, hold on, hold on. Listen. In prayer, she just prayed then and cry out in prayer to the Lord. She knows she, he's there because she's at the mercy seat. She felt it, her, his power. She knows he's there and he did not answer. Don't you recognize that sometimes God will remain silent in your life just to help you? To take you through the channel he wants to take you? 
that God will go silent sometime? It's a lesson that while she was praying, we know by reading the scripture that Jesus was there. God wants us to tell you that when you pray and sometimes nothing happens, he's saying, I'm there. Hallelujah. I'm there still. You're praying for that headache and that stress, Sister Nicole, to leave you. And you're praying and praying and say, where is God? He wants to let you know that I'm still there, but I'm working in the meanwhile. I'm doing something. Allow me to work in your life. Don't tell me how to drive. Mercy. God wants to drive for you. Hear this now. While the disciples came and said, send her away. That's double problem. Instead of them come and say, Jesus, you know, this lady came from far and her daughter is possessed. I'm sure if we had somebody come in here for prayer now and they needs prayer, some of the members here are going to come and say, let's gather around, let's tarry, and they will bring encouragement. The disciples come and even make it worse because it's itself was in the church. The disciples represent the church, that the church will discourage you in prayer. While you pray, the church will come and say, why you pray like that? Don't get that person to pray. Discouragement will come while you pray. Right in the midst of she praying. And God did not answer. You got to get it. She was in prayer, you see. Look at it in the spiritual realm. That she was communing with God in silence then. And as she was communing, just kind of get this picture I'm painting here. And while she was communing with God, the Lord says nothing. And then the disciples come over and says, this woman is in our territory here. It's either you heal her and send her away, or you get her out of here because she's disturbing. When we pray sometimes and we stay on our knee, knees, some people will see us as discouragement. Some people will see us as disturbance. Mercy. When you come to the mercy seat, the enemy is working, you see. And while you're praying, some people will say, oh, he's discouraging me. Why is he there? Destruction will come in the midst of prayer. This woman was there. Her daughter was home, possessed. We don't know if anybody was staying with her daughter. Her daughter probably was ripping up everything home. And she was there beseeching God pleading at the mercy seat, asking for help, not giving up, gaining strength and praying without ceasing. And she was praying. And while she was praying, the disciples come and make matters worse. Send her away. She's disturbing the church. Everybody get together on the board and say, get rid of that person. When that person is connecting in the spiritual realm, when God is working in the meanwhile, some people will come and say, you are this, you are that. This unknown woman was feeling the pain. This unknown woman knows how to pray more than a lot of us as Adventists. She wasn't coming from the ordinary church. It wasn't a Seventh-day Adventist church she's coming from. And she knows how to pray. She knows how to stay on her knees. She was connecting with Christ while everyone was wondering and criticizing her. It get worse. Look at the next verse. 24. It got even worse. Lord of mercy, it says. But he answered and said. I want to tell you then. Create the scene that when the woman asked God for help, Jesus, he moves away. Because he said the disciples came unto him. It's like he, 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 he don't answer, plus he walk away from her. And the disciples went to Jesus and said, send her away. Why you have her here? They were touting. The enemy was working in the church. The enemy wants to cause disunity while you pray. But this woman wasn't giving up because she knows she have an emergency situation at home. She knows that prayer works. She knows that prayer moved the hand of God. She knows that when two or three get together, there's power. She knows when Jesus is in the midst, she's not going to let go. She's going to wrestle with Jesus. She was wrestling. And listen to this now. It says, the Lord answered her in verse 24 and says, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep 
of the house of Israel. It's even get worse. The Lord look on her and says, by the way, she, he turned around and looked back on her and said, hey, by the way, I'm not here for you. I'm here for my people, the Israelites. I'm not even here for you. That is more discouragement. Lord of mercy, you are discouraged while you're praying and you're wondering, where is God? This woman was praying and the Lord said to her, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I'm not here for you. I'm here for the chosen. I'm here for my people. I'm not here for you. Listen, listen, listen now. Verse 25, it says, Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Lord of mercy. So the Lord, all the discouragement while you're on your knees praying, are you praying? The woman probably was standing and praying then. And it says, when she heard that, I am just come for the lost sheep. That moved the woman's heart and said, the Lord spoke to me. Even if he said, not today, wait until next year. Even if you're praying to get married and he said, next three years, you don't get discouragement. When the Lord says, I'm not here for you, she weren't discouraged with the answer of prayer. She move over and fall on her knees now and start to worship. Worship God. How can you not get an answer and you continue in worship? Oh, thou son of the most high God. Oh, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. She came and she knelt down and started to pray and it says she worshiped. In your discouragement, you worship. In the negativity, in the nothingness, in the no jobs, in the brokenness in the family. In the families are broken up. You worship. That's power. If you have to wait until everything is going good to worship, hello somebody. If you can worship in your, in, your, in your problem, if you can worship when you're in the miry clay, if you can worship when you're down on your back, there is power. There is power. You're not crying. You're not crying. There is power. The woman, Christ just made a statement that is so powerful. Some people said, what kind of God is this? Sometimes we get some answers in prayer and we are saying, God, you don't love me. Because we're looking for selfish answer. The disciples want Jesus to get up and say, get out of here. We are people, we are Seventh-day Adventists. Get out of here. We don't mingle with Sunday keepers. That's what they want the Lord to say. But still the Lord says, in a nice way. I'm not here for you. I'm here for the lost sheep. And the woman went and knelt down and started to pray and worship him. Lord of mercy. Can you learn something about praying? That it doesn't matter. It's not about self. It's not about how you feel. It's not about where you're going. It's not about what you want. But if you know that Savior, oh, thou son of David, have mercy. If you know that Savior and you know how to pray in your situation, in your problem. And listen to this. When she fall down and worship, when she worship, she said, have mercy. She asked the Lord, help me. Short prayer. She did not go through again and say, forgive me of all my sins and everything. Because when you come in the presence of God, there's worship. When you come in the presence of the Lord, there's forgiveness. When you come in the presence and you fall on your knees, there's anointing. When you fall in the presence of Jesus, there's anointing. God wants us to fall in his presence. And if we come in prayer and fall in his presence, there's power. He will give his angel charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Listen to this. We're winding down soon. We're going to finish soon. Listen. Verse 26 says, But he answered and said, It is not meat to feed the children, children's bread and to cast it to the dogs. It's very powerful. 
more discouragement and discouragement. God is saying, in your discouragement, I want to bring you higher. In your discouragement, God wants to give you a breakthrough. God says, it's not fear then for me to take away the work that I come to do and to feed people, my people, Israel, and take it and give it to you, to the dogs. Some people question and say, why God do this? But what that is saying is that whatever you're going through, God is working in the meanwhile. He knows the outcome. He knows the promise. He knows where he's going to take you. So here it is now. The Lord says, listen, it's not fair for me to take the children's bread off the table and feed it to the dogs. He's saying, listen, I did not come for this purpose. I came to save Israel, my people, but they rejected me. They don't even want to hear me. Listen, it gets worse. God was just telling her the truth here, and it's for a purpose. And look at the next verse, verse 27, and it says, And she said, True Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Lord of mercy. What you got to get there is that she recognized who the master is. She recognized who the great I am is. And when she held on, she said, I don't care what you say. I don't care what your answer is, is to prior. I know I'm going through a test and I ain't going to let go. I know you are the master. No matter if the crumbs come, if the little brata come, I'm happy with the brata from the Lord. I'm happy with the leftover from the Lord's table because he is the I am. Who is the I am? Are you happy with the leftover? I'll pray forget the leftover from the Lord's table. That is power. Even the crumbs carry power. The lady recognized that the crumbs carry power. But we don't recognize it. Do you know who the master's table represent? Do you know the master's table? The great I am, you goes to the master's table, you will be shaking and trembling in the presence of God. That's where the master dwell. That's his hiding place. That is pavilion. That is mercy seat. Any little leftover crumbs, even the shadow of the Almighty. Even under the shadow of the Almighty, if you abide there, there's power. Even the little crumbs fall on you, there's power. Do you recognize the crumbs from God? Lord of mercy. The lady said, even the crumbs I'm happy with. Even if you don't answer my prayer exactly the way I want it, Lord. It's the attitude of prayer. It's the attitude and the approach we take to God. When we come to God and say, God, take me as I am. Whatever you choose is. Most people come and say, Lord, I want you to do this. I need this job by tomorrow. I need that type of car, God. And if it don't happen, we stop, go to church. That's it. We cut God off. We don't get it. God is giving us a message tonight as we close. God is giving us a message that the woman, a no-name brand, a woman, a Canaanite woman from nowhere, woman wasn't even recognized. God is saying, if you are not recognized, just come to me in prayer. I love you. I care for you. I know what you're going through. I love you. Just come to me in prayer and I will hear. The Lord answers in the last verse I will read. Then Jesus, in verse 28, then Jesus answered, answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou will. And it says, and her daughter was made whole from that very hour. That very hour, the Lord's anointed. That very hour, the Lord answers the woman prior. God is working in the meanwhile. Jesus is saying, come and pray. Come to the mercy seat and I will answer you. Imagine how that woman felt. The Lord just said the word. In other words, when we approach God, don't come and approach him based on his answers. 
God wants us to exercise patience. He wants us to come to him in worship on our knees, knowing that he's the God who is at the mercy seat. He's the one who is at the table, who is able to put food, spiritual food, physical food on your table. God is in charge. The woman did not quit amidst all the discouragement in prayer. Even when the church, his disciples say, send her away. Get rid of her. Whatever you have to do, heal her and send her, whatever. The Lord still wait patiently as the woman press. Can we press for your situation that you're going through? Can't you press as we close now? Brethren, can't we press with what you're going through, the woman did not quit. She continued to press, and she wasn't one from the culture. She wasn't an Israelite. She's a no name, nobody knows her, but she knows that Christ is the son of David, the God whom we serve. Do you know the God whom you pray to? Do you know when you pray who you pray to? Do you believe? that God can answer your prayers. She just said the word. She, he didn't have to go to her house, and she believed. It's impossible to please God without faith. That woman pleased God. He said he has never seen such great faith. He sent the woman home, healed, being restored. But look what the woman went through. You think your situation is bad? Who have a daughter home now possessed and ripping up herself? And we think our situation bad? That woman, woman came to God and did not quit. God is asking us tonight, don't give up. Don't quit. If you want God to do something for you, go to him. Ask him. But if you get no answer, don't quit. Because he's working in the meanwhile. God is saying to you tonight, brethren, I love you. I want you to pray like this woman pray. Pray and believe. The woman saw Christ. Pray like you've seen him. You know he's here. And you will get answer to your prayers. God is bidding us and say amidst the discouragement, amidst the, the, the unfavorable answers, Christ is still Christ. And in the end, things are going to work out. Even though the discouragement was upon this woman, in the end, it paid off. In the end, she did not regret. She knew who Christ was. Do you know who Christ is? May you stand with me as I'm going to pray. You're watching tonight and you want God to really give you this drive to pray. Like this woman, this Canaanite woman. You want God to give you that zeal to pray. He's able to give you, to come to him, regardless of what you're going through. He's able. Let us pray. Father in heaven, great God, you've seen your people watching tonight. You've seen your people in the sanctuary. Lord, we want to pray even a little bit like this woman who did not cease from praying, who prayed without ceasing. You are our king. You are our savior. You are God. There's none like you. Holy Spirit, have your own way now upon our hearts. Teach us, oh God, how to come to the mercy seat. Teach us how to love, to pray, and to love you. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do here for your children. Thank you for the way you're going to take us to a different level. That even when there's no answers... Even when you go silent on us, you're silent on some people for five, six years now. They're praying for something and nothing is happening. Lord, I pray that we will be filled with your power and you will help us to wait on you. They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. We will go up like eagle. Lord, help us. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us. May you water our souls now, all those who are watching, and we give you all the glory and the praise. In Jesus Christ's name, I pray these things. Amen and amen. You may be seated.
We just want to say again, thanks for watching us at Button to Christ. Thanks for listening to us, all those who are on the prayer line. Keep us in prayer. We need all your prayers, all your support. I am Patrick Baker from Button to Christ Ministry. Until next week, stay strong in Jesus' name. Thanks for watching this program. We hope that you were blessed. To further your support with us, please consider giving a donation at buttontochrist.com or .org. Any amount is appreciated and will be used for the continued growth of our ministry and the spreading of the gospel to the world. May God richly bless you and we'll see you next time.